Welcome to this podcast review for October 15th, 2024, and I'm Jada Duran. And I'm Brendan Cassidy. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody, for a conversation, a review that will be chaotic, anxiety-riddled, and who knows, maybe Live there'll be a bunch of cameos. from the internet, it is in session film. <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> if only we were live maybe one day we can do a live episode we've talked about it for we have yeah quite we have talked time. about that yeah uh I, yeah. I, I don't know if we're skilled enough to do that i feel like there'll be a lot of fumbles i think if we'll would we need a lauren michaels like to produce it i think he'd be able to help us get in the right perhaps direction. yeah perhaps we'll need to find a producer we certainly have the capabilities to do it uh we could we could make this episode go live right now if we wanted to we could but we could we're not going to do that. No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> we value the uh, efforts of post-production a little yeah. bit too much. Yeah, which you don't always have that luxury when it's your first show. Right, right. I can relate in many regards when we did our first episode of In Session Film back in 2013. That is not a show I would have wanted to go live at all. <laughs> You know, I'm half tempted to scrub it from the internet, generally speaking. I was going to say, is that one that still exists? It's out there. No, it's there. It's, it's available there. on the feed. If you subscribe to the show, you have access for now. For <laughs> now. I'm half tempted <laughs> to scrub it. But, so I can understand. I can understand the anxieties yeah. of it. Sometimes 10 years does have a It Sometimes there's a lot of growth with that, right? Yeah. You grow. You grow, you grow. over 10 you years, learn. 30 years. You know, 50 years, no matter how long you're doing a show. We're still doing the show 50 years later. That means the Internet's in a weird place. (laughs) Well, the Internet's already dead. Uh, But we're (laughs) here just floating around all of the tombs. The podcast will be in a newspaper form in like 50 years. Everything will just go back to the Stone Age. Indeed. Uh, We are, of course, here to talk about the new film Saturday Night, as we are cryptically alluding to Saturday Night Live and its crazy history. Um, and I'm very excited joining us for this episode. We have a really fun guest. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to get him on the show for a little while. He finally agreed. I captured him. <laughs> He's here. The great Brian Sudfield is joining us. Brian, welcome to the show, my friend. Yeah. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. It's true. Yeah. You finally captured me. I can't get out of here no you matter how hard I try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it just goes to show how. Leaves, yeah, that just goes to show how desperate we are for guests. We yeah. kidnap people for it. He I'm, might. I was the last person on the list. The last person. <laughs> yeah. I just had to get him to sign the contract. I caught him down at the ice rink. We talked him into coming back, and he's here. So what's fine? Everything's good. Uh, well, now I'm gonna mistakenly call him John Belushi this whole episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, we're we're very excited to have you here, Brian. Have been following you for a little while, mm-hmm. um, listening to you on on your show and everything you're doing now with the rolling tape and the podcast and everything you guys are doing. It's very exciting. So I'm so happy to have you here. I know you you saw this film at Toronto, so maybe you can give us some insight into not just your experience on the film, but perhaps how people received it at TIFF. That could be part of this conversation as well. Yep. So um, really glad to have you here. I'm excited to to dig into this movie with you. So uh, as we do, uh, let's intro this movie. Saturday yeah. Night, it is the latest film from Jason Reitman. And it stars. And this is going to be a while, so buckle I've up. Got, I've got a time It'll around, be about JD, so let's we'll just see minutes. how this goes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have Gabriel LaBelle, Rachel Sennett, Corey Michael Smith, Dylan O'Brien, Emily Fairn, Ella Hunt, Lauren Morris, Matt Wood, Finn Wolfhard, I, which I don't know why he's in this film. Maybe we can get to that as well. Does he even have a Nicholas- character name? It just says as NBC, NBC page, page. <laughs> which is hilarious to me. <laughs> Doesn't even have a character. It's not name. an accident. That's not an accident. Yeah. It's definitely part of the joke. Nicholas Braun and Nicholas Braun. Can't forget the both of them. 
oh, yeah. Cooper Hoffman, and the list goes on and on. Willem Dafoe, Matthew Rice, J.K. Simmons, John Batiste. Uh, yeah. The cast goes on and on. There's there's a bazillion people. All right, that show. took about 45 seconds, but I did interject a few times, so let's just say about 30. Yeah, and I, I obviously I left out quite a few others yeah. as well. <laughs> so yeah. I tried to try to get to the main ones at the very least. Um, if you're not familiar with Saturday Night, at 11.30 on October 11th, 1975, a ferocious troop of young comedians and writers changed television forever. We find out what happened behind the scenes in the 90 minutes leading up to the first broadcast of Saturday Night Live. All right, let's dig into this. Brian, what did you think about Saturday Night? So... I was really excited to see this. I'm a fan of SNL, definitely. Um, earlier on in the year, I went on to Peacock and I binged a whole bunch of original SNL in preparation for this, mm. just to familiarize myself with that specific time frame of SNL. Yeah. And yeah. obviously, that was the SNL that my parents grew up on and everything. So sure. I wanted to make sure I was well rounded before I saw this movie. And like you said, I saw this movie at TIFF. A little over a month ago, it premiered that Tell You Ride and got mm -hmm. a lot of buzz coming out of it. A lot of people said that it was a hilarious romp. It was such a good time. It was very much a comedic thriller, which was something that I never anticipated hearing. But after watching the trailer, I was like, I get that vibe tremendously. Mm -hmm. And watching it at TIFF. And I can tell you this right now. I want to get this out of the way. I've only seen this just a one time at TIFF. I haven't been able okay. to see this movie again since. But watching it at TIFF, I saw it with a ginormous crowd. Everybody from the cast was there. Jason Reitman was there. The energy mm -hmm. in that room was unlike anything that I honestly had ever yeah, witnessed. it sounds electric. It, mm -hmm. it was very electric, which was a perfect crowd to watch a movie like this with because yeah. you don't want to watch this in a very tame environment because, one, it's a comedy, and you obviously want to be surrounded by people that are having a good time. Two, mm -hmm. this is a very special film because it's coming out as we are in the 50th season of SNL. The fact yeah. that this show yeah. has been around for half a century now is absolutely mm -hmm. mind bending to say the yeah. least. Mm -hmm. And being in that room with that audience was one of my favorite theater going experiences that I've had in a very long time. Cause you could feel mm. the energy was so high at that screaming that I can't even imagine what it was like watching this movie in a regular audience simply because I haven't done it yet. I've only watched yeah. it at TIFF, but I walked out this movie in love with it now there could be a bit of bias towards it considering the fact that i watched it with a festival audience and mm -hmm. sometimes when you watch movies with that sort of crowd it could heighten your feelings towards the movie even if you could recognize oh sure. this movie is very flawed to say the least yeah. but having sin not having sat on it for a little over a month at this point I genuinely think that this movie warts for me in ways that I clearly was not anticipating. I mm -hmm. figured that I was going to have a great time with it. I figured that I was going to laugh nonstop throughout the movie. But what I really admired about it was that it was this beautiful capsule of this significant period in time, not just for comedy television, but television period. And as someone who loves learning about the behind the scenes stories of film and television, and especially something like this, I was very impressed with the way that Jason Reitman executed this story. And you could tell that there was so much love poured into presenting the story that mm. he could have gone down the conventional biopic route, but mm -hmm. the decision to present this in real time having it take place within the 90 to 100 minutes leading up to the first taping of Saturday Night Live was insane. It's frenetic. It's quick. It's hyperactive. It's hilarious, like I said, but it's also very anxiety-inducing. There were plenty of moments where I was on the edge of my seat, even though I obviously know the outcome of yeah. this story. I was still like, this is insane, and I don't even know how to feel about this because I'm just all over the place freaking out for these characters on screen just to bring this show to life and make it work as strongly as it ended up working. Yeah. But sure. 
Yeah, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan good, of the movie. Good. And it's and it's interesting too to see the reactions for the film now that it's finally out in the world. I really thought that this was going to be a much more celebrated film. And the people that love this movie really, really love it. Mm. Not that this film has been getting terrible reviews. I'm very surprised by how mixed the reactions are to this i'm a little surprised i feel like i'm on my own little island of loving this movie <laughs> which hey i'm happy to be on that island because i fine, really yeah. adore the film <laughs> makes it's you want to defend it even harder yeah, right? Abs sure. absolutely yeah. and yeah i do think that this is jason reitman's best film in years i can't tell you the last mm -hmm. time that i watched a movie from him that i at least liked probably up in the air 15 years ago that might have been the last one from him that i genuinely was very impressed by and there are people that have called this the best film he's ever done which is absolutely ridiculous because it's, it's far from that but in terms of what he's made in recent memory it's definitely yeah. a stronger entry in his filmography to say yeah. the least and it definitely feels a bit aaron sorkin esque with the screenplay everyone's just talking it's mm -hmm. very rapid fire it's quick there's not really many moments to breathe and calm down and when there are it's great i definitely wish we got a bit more of that but overall i love the film i had a great time with it i thought it was a beautiful ode to this time frame and it really knocked my socks off i was very impressed i was excited to see it mm -hmm. and i figured that i was gonna like it but it somehow surpassed my expectations and i was a big fan of nice. it yeah, and I, yeah. I do know what you're talking about, that there are reactions to the film now that are either very celebratory, like yours are, or maybe a little bit, I guess maybe lukewarm is the right yeah. word for it. Yes. And, and and in a way, I can understand that because I, I will admit, I really did enjoy this movie. Um, at the same time, I did find myself thinking, is it going to be one that I'm going to think about after I've seen it? And I don't know if that's the case, but I think that raises a pretty interesting notion that, just because it's a true story or true-ish story, I know there's a lot of fabrication here in order to amplify the drama, as you would expect, and that's perfectly fine. A movie like this sometimes needs to do that. Is it okay if it doesn't necessarily go deeper and teach us anything outside of just what's on the surface? Sometimes it's okay for a true story to simply just be entertainment. And that really is what this is. I don't think it's necessarily a deep movie by any means, but I was very entertained by it. Uh, it does have a very kinetic energy to it. There's a commitment to it. There's a conviction to it. The movie is basically the three-minute tracking shot scene for Magnolia at What Do Kids Know for 100 minutes. That's basically what the movie is. Yeah. Uh, and and, and if, if I did have any minor quibbles with the movie, they're more on me than they are on the movie. Because Jason Reitman is clearly channeling Robert Altman and Paul Thomas Anderson here. I mean, it's mm. all over this movie to the yeah. point that there are some sequences here that come dangerously close to sheer mimicry than they do genuine inspiration. And that sometimes that's not something I like to see, but it does happen maybe fewer, few more few than 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 they probably you know uh, than, than they do to distract me, I guess. But I did have a lot of fun watching this, uh, mostly because in a way. It, it isn't too committed to trying to recreate history. Uh, we have a lot of these actors here who are fairly well known, especially within our film critic circle, but they're not the they're not the kind of people that are going to sell a box office hit necessarily nowadays. Maybe in a couple of years they might, but I don't think they're quite at that level yet. So they're not giving performances that feel like spitting images of the real people they're playing. In a way, it almost kind of feels like this is an SNL sketch about SNL in a way. Um, sure. And I, yeah. I kind of admired that meta component. If that was something that Jason Reitman was even going for, I'm not really sure. Um, but I did have a lot of fun with it. It isn't my favorite Jason Reitman film. I'm with you, Brian, in the sense that movies like up in the air and thank you for smoking are probably the two best films he'll ever do. I don't know if he'll, uh, uh, I don't know if I'll like anything out uh, more than those two. Um, I'm I'm still a huge fan of Tully and Young Adult, and I think I might still slightly prefer those two films over Saturday Night. But Saturday Night has a bit of a rewatchability to it that maybe some of his other films don't quite have, and it's nice to see him play in a sandbox that's just simply entertaining. Uh, so I was I, I was a fan of it for sure. Yeah, I'm with you guys. I thought this was a lot of fun. I'm not sure how insightful it is in terms of its characters or the historical mm -hmm. context that provoked 
NBC to green light the show, but the history of SNL is so revered that Reitman recounts these events in an almost mythological fashion. And as a result, as you guys are talking about, there's a heightened energy to the film that is so palpable. There's never a moment to breathe. The camera is always in motion, sometimes dizzyingly so, yeah. as it navigates between the cast and their egos, rebellious writers trying to undermine the NBC censorship authority, incessant technical difficulties, the overstuffed lineup of the show, executives setting Michael Lauren up to fail, and his anxiety in trying to make all of this work because he believes it would revolutionize television. The line between what's real and what's exaggerated is often blurred, and that's... Yeah what makes it so fascinating to me, the chaos here mm -hmm. is folklore ish and presentation. And when you couple that with the film's yeah. vigor and humor, I found it so, so very engaging. Yeah, it almost so feels it's like a myth slightly, at times. Exactly. And I yeah. do think that is fundamentally the ethos of this film. So it's slightness didn't bother me all that much because I think that structure is quite incredible here. And it helps that the cast is remarkable. Everyone mm. is great. Perhaps we can talk about our favorites among the cast. Dylan O'Brien might take that crown for me. I thought he was fantastic as Dan Aykroyd. Uh, but everyone here is really mm -hmm. good. J.K. Simmons is having the time of his life as a scumbag antagonist to this film. And Gabriel Abel, I, I do think he, he carries this film extremely well. Mm -hmm. Again, with how he taps into that anxiety and that passion and conviction he has for what they're trying to accomplish here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Brian articulated it wonderfully in his opening thoughts. This isn't Reitman's best film, but it is his best work in quite some time. I do really like Tully. I might prefer this slightly to that film, but I think they're both and a similar-ish territory in terms of his filmography. Um, mm -hmm. Either way, this is quite um, a jump up from his previous outings the last few years. Uh, I like Reitman when <laughs> well, he's well, playing you, in you the wouldn't, You wouldn't rather watch Labor Day again? Uh, no, no more Labor Days. <laughs> Men, women, and children, I think I like more than most, but I much That's prefer... still not that good. At least it's a bit more ambitious <laughs> than Labor Day was. Yeah, for sure. And and I, I agree with you, Brennan, that at times, while the film might come close to imitation territory with mm -hmm. the filmography and the way a lot of this film is shot and, and captured visually, um, I will take that over, again, the the director for higher stuff that he's done the last oh oh years. yeah no more ghostbusters afterlife I'll take I, I don't i don't yeah. i don't need any of that and, and again i think building this film fundamentally as this mythological creature that has all of these arms tangling all over the place mm -hmm. um i loved that i thought that was a really fun approach to this film and i had a great time yeah and even jason reitman's writing partner here gil keenan who also worked with him on both of those ghostbusters films afterlife and was a frozen i i frozen, frozen empire, empire was that the name yeah. of I, I don't even yeah. remember the name of that one but gil keenan i think directed that it's almost as if those two films were made just so they can fund this one uh, mm -hmm. so it becomes kind of like a one for did me did that come out you, earlier kind of, this year frozen empire uh, yeah I, I, I did yeah. it jeez mm -hmm. might be the worst movie Man. of the year i don't even remember <laughs> <laughs> that scared me that feels like so long ago <laughs> oh my god that film is frozen in time right now I, <laughs> yeah um i think dylan wow. o'brien's really good here jd i think he is one of the standouts yeah. here if i had to pick someone off the cuff you know i really liked Corey michael smith as chevy chase probably because mm, he had the most yeah. difficult task out of anyone here sure because uh, chevy chase is so like just chevy chase as a figure is so notorious like, like, people know his demeanor they know his snarky dry exterior and Corey michael smith doesn't really 100 percent tap into it but you definitely sense the seeds of chevy chase there and in a way talking about the maybe mythological elements of this movie this film kind of gives a hypothetical answer as to why chevy chase is kind of a scumbag in real life now because there's a moment where it seems like the stardom is about to go to his head because someone calls him out for being perhaps the most talented person in the cast so there is almost like this 
meta answer of sorts as to why Chevy himself is apparently not the easiest person to work with. That's sort of part of like the, uh, you know, like the community history. There's all, all those stories from Joel McHale and people that have worked with Chevy Chase who have said pretty negative things about working with the man, despite how funny and talented that he is. And this film, Saturday Night specifically, is kind of tapping into that lore a little bit. I, and that's what's interesting. I don't often like lore for lore's sake, but this movie taps into the idea of lore in a real-time sense that was kind of fascinating. Uh, and, mm -hmm. I, and I thought that was a neat way to go about it, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, going off the performance talk, I mean, Corey Michael Smith was probably my favorite in terms of okay. the actors playing cast members on SNL. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much to say about the non SNL cast members in this yeah. film, but there sure. is one thing that I definitely want to touch upon very briefly. And I would love to get your insight on this. Both of you. Um, okay. The female cast members of SNL. Um, I thought all of them were very well cast. I just mm -hmm. wish that they had more material to work with. Cause like yeah. Jane Curtin, Gilda Ratner, uh, Lorraine Newman, those are all so talented. They're so talented, especially Gilda Radner. I mean, she was unlike anyone else, truly. And as I said at the top, I did some mm -hmm. watching of the original season and everything and a few clips following the first season. And Gilda Radner was some something else. And I was really yeah. kind of disappointed. As a fan of the movie, I was really disappointed that she, as well as the other women in the film really didn't get enough time to shine. And I know because this is a massive ensemble piece, not everyone is going to get their opportunity to shine. Mm -hmm. But like you said, JD, everyone was really great in the film, regardless of how big or small their screen time was. And this being an ensemble piece, everyone got at least, you know, between probably like five to 15 minutes of screen time. Obviously Gabriel LaBelle has the most screen time because he's the person yeah. that we follow throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do wish that we had been given an opportunity to have the women shine in the film because, you know, these are three very talented comedians and the actors that they got to play them were spot on, especially uh, Kim Matola, who played Jane Curtin. I mean, she looked mm -hmm. exactly like her. It was pretty uncanny. Like she nailed the mannerisms of her so perfectly. But mm -hmm. I do wish that there was more time given to them. But everyone knocked it out of the park. And after we're done talking about the specific section, I definitely would love to get your guys' perspective on the non-SNL cast members in this film. Because, oh, sure. I yeah. mean, there's so much to say about all of them. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To quickly speak to the female cast members here specifically, I will mostly agree, especially with regard to how Lorraine Newman and Jane Curtin were portrayed here i do think that kim matola and emily Farron, respectively do really great jobs capturing the essence of both jane and lorraine um but maybe they were a little bit underutilized i guess the one moment that kind of saves it a little bit for me is a moment towards the end involving an ice rink i'll simply say mm -hmm. where gilda yeah. radner portrayed by ella hunt has this kind of emotional it's not really a monologue but it almost feels like it's on the verge of becoming a monologue and knowing what tragically happened to Gilda Radner in real life, passing away at, with uh, due to ovarian cancer, it actually adds another layer to that monologue that I think actually kind of justified Ella Hunt's performance and her. It adds some levity to the moment for sure. Yeah, yeah, I'd say like it, it wasn't necessarily enough to fully save maybe how much they feel like background characters by right. comparison, but it was the one moment where I felt like, okay, by keeping her more in the background and then having that one moment just come out of nowhere, knowing that Gilda was going to pass away uh, at a relatively young age, mm -hmm. uh, that, that at least fixed some of it for me. And I think Ella Hunt sells that moment very yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm generally with you guys in that, the female characters here probably are a little bit more underutilized. But mm -hmm. as I somewhat noted in my opening thoughts, I don't think that the film is terribly interested in exploring these characters with any sort of depth. I don't think there's much insight here into mm -hmm. who they are. There's some of that with Chevy, maybe a little bit with John Belushi, but I don't, mm -hmm see any of that as truly nuanced. I think most mm -hmm. of that 
is servicing, again, the film's fundamental mythological approach. And mm -hmm. I would argue that for really all of the nostalgia and the callbacks that this film introduces, I think a lot of it is really fun. It's humorous for a lot of it. I never found the film winking or being tacky with any of it. And I think when you look at the film from that prism, so many of the elements of this film, scenes, specific moments, I think mm -hmm. shed a little bit more light or make more sense from that context, including that moment yeah. you're talking about there, Brendan, with Radner and Belushi. And I've seen yeah. some criticisms about how saccharine that is for some or how it's superficial yeah. foreshadowing or ironic given the tragedies of both of them. Yeah. But I I tend to agree with you, especially given at least how I interpret the film and it's in the way it's almost playing this as folklore. Yeah. And having uh, that moment, I found it more poetic than saccharine. You know, I, you know, it's the same thing of like Jim Henson and Andy Kaufman, mm -hmm. why I don't feel like they're shoehorned here yeah. or Carlson and Burley as these symbolic villains. And perhaps we can, talk about that further as well. But that makes sense to me when you look at it from that specific point of view. If you're not willing to embrace that, I could see how this film would be troublesome for a lot of people because it's not terribly insightful. But this film is wanting to have fun, and it is. It's often very humorous. It's chaotic. It's frenetic, as mm -hmm. we've been talking about. And as a result, some characters are lost more in the shuffle. And unfortunately, yeah. some of the female comedians here are those that are a little bit more lost. I don't disagree with that criticism per se, but I don't think any of these characters are terribly insightful. I think it's more about... They're not really characters. Uh, they're that's, not really yeah. characters. Yeah. yeah, I mean, as you somewhat talked about, Brennan, it's it's like a SNL sketch about SNL. Yeah. When you watch an SNL sketch, you're not watching it for character depth or nuance. <laughs> like I, I don't just, know. That they're... that recent Beavis and Butthead sketch had a lot of depth to it. <laughs> That's more, so much more than for most yeah, Let's analyze that. It's <laughs> <days. laughs> <is> very thought-provoking <laughs> and thematically really nuanced. Uh, no, I mean, and this is tapping into a similar vein to capture that energy of this 90 minutes and the chaos and everything that unfolded. And there's so much lore about these individuals already. Why would the film spend more time building up something that we're already familiar with. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're not familiar with these actors or SNL, then perhaps you'll feel a little lost, but I don't think that's necessarily the film's fault. I kind of love that mm. it chooses that approach. To me, that's a strength, not a weakness. To it's, the it's, film. it's like this overarching greatness that you hear about, but you don't fully understand. And when someone tells you a story yeah. about, let's say, some mythological figure, maybe like the fam most famous sports player of all time. When someone grows up hearing about Michael Jordan, but they didn't grow up with him, then they hear about this, they hear about him as this like mythological being of sorts. It yeah. still has this overarching power to it, even if you don't fully understand it. And yeah. I do think this film is tapping into that, which is why despite the maybe saccharine nature of that scene we're talking about towards the end, I think it does complement the the lore of it, as you're talking about, JD. I think it yeah. actually it, it it adds a layer to it. Uh, it. But if it wasn't going for that type of mythological power, then maybe it would be something to criticize. But I I, yeah. I don't I don't think it necessarily is because they're not meant to be characters. They're meant to be they're almost like meant to be statues, like that we worship, that we think mm -hmm. about as a representation of this great idea that Lorne Michaels had that still has relevance today. Uh, and, and, and I think it has that power for sure. Yeah. Brian, you want to jump in? Yeah, no, I mean, I can't say any more of what you guys were alluding to and everything. Although when you brought up the sports analogy, I'm like, all right, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> we make Fair that enough. running joke on the podcast a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes no, this turns into in session sports and then we have to cut ourselves short because we know our listeners <laughs> might not know what yeah. the hell is. A lot of people don't care. <laughs> it's perfectly understandable. But in this in this case, I, I do think it's it's a little apt because you are right, Brennan. I specifically mm -hmm. think of something like the meme of Michael Jordan and the F them kids. Oh yeah. Quote yeah. That is often attached to <laughs> yeah. Michael Jordan. Yeah. Did he really say that? I don't 
like I, I think it's fascinating that th- that could just be left to the ether, whether that happened or not. And <laughs> I just got to love that it's part of his legacy, whether that mm-hmm. happened or not. And mm-hmm. this film is kind of tapping into a similar thing. Like, yeah, everything that we see here might not have been exact, but let's use the existing lore, what we think about these characters yeah. and who they were and how they were a part of this process to revolutionize television. Let's use that to our advantage to create scenes, moments, uh, quirks that uh, elicit either the chaos of the moment or something about those characters individually to, mm-hmm. you know, kind of amplify what SNL is at its core. Yeah. And that I thought was a pretty brilliant touch. It might not yeah. be completely uh, seamless, but I think it's it's more robust than it isn't in terms of, you know, executing on it. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And going back to the performances for a second, you know, we touched upon some of the SNL cast members. There's obviously mm-hmm. a lot more people to this ensemble that weren't a part of the SNL team in front of the camera and they were behind the camera. Yeah, yeah. For me personally, I mean, I, I everyone did a good job, but low key, the MVP for me might have been Cooper Hoffman oh, as Dick yeah. Ebersole. I like he might have been mm-hmm. my favorite. Now, I'm a huge licorice pizza fan, so I was really excited yeah. to see more of Cooper Hoffman and everything. Sure. And yeah. And of course, he's in a movie that's ripping on PTA once again. Which I yeah, thought abso- was, yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's never yeah. going to leave him. Like, he's no, always going to no. be associated with that. Absolutely. And not that that's a bad thing, but it, no, it's really cool thing. to see him in another film, you know, set in the 70s as well. Like, another period piece of sorts and everything. Yeah. But um, I just want to acknowledge a few things regarding this performance. First of all, there were moments in the movie where it was very uncanny watching him because there were so many moments where he resembled his father. There's a particular Mm -hmm. sequence when he's in the control room smoking a cigarette and he looks just like his father. It's literally uncanny. It's it's so funny that you bring that up because I loved Cooper Hoffman in this film as well. And similarly, a different moment though in the stairwell when my favorite he, scene of the entire film he, my favorite he, scene mm-hmm. when he gets when his performance gets heightened slightly slightly as he's having this heated conversation with Michael Lauren and when that happens when his performance elevates slightly with his mannerisms and his vocal tics there it was so reminiscent of Philip Seymour Hoffman i yeah. had an out of body experience I almost fell out of my seat and like immediately <laughs> lost it. Like in a film that is a comedy, it's a ton of fun as we've been talking about. Yeah. And yet that moment and how it, he elicits his father there. I was on the verge of tears. Like it was just so we talked about that a lot. His during father come lic- through there. Yeah. We talked about that a lot during licorice pizza as well. When we reviewed yeah. that, we definitely sensed a lot of his father, especially the ma- like, like, like it was almost like it was foreshadowing the mattress man from Punch Drunk Love in many ways. Um, yeah. but yeah, you you could really see a lot of Coop- a lot of Philip Seymour Hoffman in Cooper's performance once again, and he's he, he's not giving the biggest performance here in many ways. He's probably no, giving no, the smallest not. performance, yeah. uh, and it's it's also a performance that's very clearly Cooper Hoffman. And he's not really yeah. channeling, even though he's playing a real person. He's not really channeling any mannerisms or anything like that. Which is, I think, I think that's what makes him kind of, uh, uh, like, actually, it's what gives the movie some authentic and dramatic momentum for sure. Uh, certainly helps in that regard. Helps ground the movie in a way. Yeah, I think and, he's so and crucial. I, I think that's a really great point. That generally he is distinctive from his father. I, you know, yeah. it's not like he's an exact replica of yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman. But there yeah. are moments, such as when he gets heightened in the stairwell. Or as Brian is talking about smoking the cigarette, like there's just these specific moments where, like, oh my god, that's that's Philip Seymour Hoffman, right? Like it comes yeah. through him getting all and- giddy with the Polaroid too. <laughs> like that was adorable. Yeah. And when he finally yeah. gets his Polaroid so moment good. at the end, is on. Yeah. It's so I got sweet. a camera. <laughs> <laughs> Like when he was smiling with that camera, it just reminded me of Philip Seymour Hoffman smiling at uh, some of the films that he did early on in his career. And I'm just like, my God, like, oh, I could yeah. totally see him like chasing a tornado like Dusty Wood. Oh, Twister. oh <laughs> absolutely. <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> Why wasn't he in Twisters? I know. <laughs> I know. I've got a camera. It's the wonder of it's the wonder of nature, baby. Yeah. So oh, good. man, man. But no, I like. 
And it's interesting too when thinking about the cast in this film, and I definitely mm-hmm. want to get your insight on this. The decision to cast a lot of people in their early 20s to play people in their 30s, do you feel that took you guys out of the movie? Because there are some people that I've talked to mm-hmm. where they're like, Gabriel LaBelle is 21 years old and Lauren Michaels is like 32. Why didn't they just cast someone that was in their 30s to play this role instead of casting someone that was literally a baby? Mm. Mm, yeah, I I don't mind that, and I think primarily. I don't either. I think it's a really cool choice, personally. Well, I think I think because it actually speaks to the level of, dare I say, immaturity of SNL. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I, and I think by casting young, I think it kind of maybe literalizes that idea a little bit in a way that maybe in any other movie I would critique that by making it too obvious. But sometimes in a movie that is all about lore building and mythological worshiping if you will sometimes it is okay to be a bit literal in that regard uh so like like it 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 took me back to the childish nature of snl uh and even even looking back on some of those early seasons which i was a fan of as well i think about how old they were at the time how old chevy chase and dan Aykroyd and john belushi and everyone was but they they actually they they acted so much younger than their ages seem to suggest that I think it actually mm-hmm. spoke it speaks to that idea by casting young to retain that overall idea I think yeah, yeah it is an interesting juxtaposition to mm-hmm. the usual Hollywood trope in that regard yeah. when you're casting thirty two year olds to play high schoolers mm-hmm. and how jarring that can be in a lot of film or TV such as yeah. that last season of stranger things when it's like okay we've grown beyond where what the characters ages are and this is just <laughs> really strange and the makeup just isn't working anymore it's like if anyone if if anyone ever watched the show glee by the time that they were seniors in high school they were played by 40 year olds <laughs> it's just like, and that's been the usual hollywood trick where yeah. it's you're casting older actors to play much younger characters grease this is, Grease yeah, did that, Greece, like big Breakfast example. Club yeah. did that as well. Breakfast Club, and yeah, I mean it's it's something that's happened so many times, and this is, I guess, the opposite problem problem. But I mm-hmm. did not have an issue with it at all. In fact, until you brought it up there, Brian, it wasn't even a thought that I had. Like I was completely. Yeah, I mean, into... like when when I walked out of the movie at TIFF, I was just so over the moon about the cast and everything. I heard some people being like, "I wish they cast older people." Not that the performances were bad; they weren't like distant the performances, but they had just would have bought it more had the roles been played by people of the age that they were supposed to be played by it. But I don't think that was really that much of a problem. Do you think that's an illusion that could be created when we see some of these actors in previous roles where they clearly were playing teenagers for teenage movies? And I think of someone like Dylan O'Brien, who we saw in, let's say, the Maze Runner films, for instance, which were very much geared towards teenagers yeah. and we're and they were about teenagers mm-hmm. sometimes you can't separate that mentality um from other performances that they're that they're going to give when they get older it's like yeah i mean we're at a point now where i feel like we could see people like daniel radcliffe and rupert grant in adult mm-hmm. performances but Absolutely. it kind of took a while to get to that point and get used it to did it. and it maybe did. that's part of the illusion that's that's happening here yeah that could be it too because some of these actors were just in movies where they played like high school characters like last yeah. year rachel senate did bottoms and she was a yeah. high schooler in that and yeah. now she's an adult in this movie pretty yeah. much around the age that she was that she is in real life and then gabriel labelle yeah. he just did the fablemans where he was yeah. obviously much younger and now he's playing mm-hmm. Lauren michaels and uh Cor- um cooper hoffman gary valentine licorice pizza was like 15 16 and now he's playing someone yeah. in his late 20s and cooper hoffman mm-hmm. i think just turned 21 time of recording so it's definitely yeah, it's, it's definitely a little jarring at first, like initially, but then once the movie really picks up and everything, like you forget about it like a minute later. You're like, oh, yeah. I forgot it that didn't they're me. I, I think it fits it's, the tone of the movie. I agree. It, it fits the tone, and as we're talking here, I think it's very complementary to what we've been talking about in terms of the film's mythological status. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I point. find that fascinating because when you're talking about this film, the idea that 
we're going to see these characters in the mid seventies, the first episode of SNL, and you're having a conversation with someone, mm -hmm. you're going to perhaps talk about, well, how old was Lauren Michaels when he was producing this show? And yeah. you might not have any sort of idea. I don't know how old Lauren yeah. Michaels is now in 2024. If I had to guess, I would say something like, I don't know, his mid twenties, maybe yeah. early thirties. And the fact that this film kind of plays with that a little bit as, as far as, you know, you have a younger actor um, that's not really appropriate of the age, but it might be something mm -hmm. that you guess, yeah. I think kind of plays into that kind of mythological. I don't know how old these guys were probably in their mid twenties is something, but I would guess. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of love that. I don't know if that was the intent, but I do think that is an ascent to yeah, the it, ideas we've been talking about. And if, if they the are intent, convincing. Yeah. That's, if, and that's yeah. the other thing. The performances here are really great. Like when you're watching Gabriel LaBelle as Lauren Michaels, you're not, you're, you shouldn't be concerned about how old he is. I certainly wasn't. I mm -hmm. was convinced that he was Lauren Michaels and the anxiety that he is invoking in his performance, that is real. That's something that character was experiencing or yeah. the relationship he has with, you know, Rosie Schuster and the dynamic of that, like that is convincing here. Cooper Hoffman is really great. And his little performance here, I don't care how old Dick Ebersole was at the time that this no, I, it, unfolded. Like, this is a I movie that's like not he... going for fact. Like in, in exactly, a way, exactly, I, exactly. I, I wouldn't say this movie is similar to this comparison I'm about to make because I think tonally they're very different and they're obviously going for different things. But I think they both have similar agendas as far as uh, I get uh, creating this mythological status for its subject matter. This mm -hmm. movie kind of reminded me of what maybe Oliver Stone was trying to do with his with doors. JFK? No, with the, the doors. doors, the doors okay. specifically, and the way he treated Jim Morrison and the rest yeah, of the Yeah, that's band. a great point. Yeah. yeah, and while there may have been a bit more of a an attempt with that movie to try and, I guess, make it seem authentic, it still felt like this heightened version of what could have been real. Uh, and this is a yeah. movie that I think is doing something similar. Uh, if it were going for fact, then I think these criticisms that other people may have had could be valid. And I may even, yeah. I may even agree with them, but I I, I don't see this as a, a historical document. I don't see it, it as, it's that, not. as that. And I don't all. think it's trying to be. I don't yeah. think it's trying to be, which is probably why I like that. I do think it is yeah. trying to be a little folk lore-ish in, in its mm. approach. And I think that's mm -hmm. certainly one of... Well, it's it's not a thing that I thought about. I'm glad Brian brought it up here because it's yeah. You know, it's it's just been it's just been a bit of a talk that I've yeah. come across and the people that I've yeah, chatted about this movie with and everything. So it, it didn't bother yeah. me. Like uh, if the actors are giving good performances, then that's what should matter. It's a good movie. But, it's a good movie. Yeah. If it's if it's succeeding yeah. what we think it's trying to do, then good 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 for the exactly movie. Yeah. exactly yeah. And the performances are convincing. Like I, I think they tap into their characters very well without all, being all, all, all the performances minus one in my opinion okay which is yeah who's that nicholas, one? nicholas braun oh, okay as um, kaufman or henson or both <laughs> yeah i was gonna say both in my in okay. my opinion both do you guys know who was supposed to play andy kaufman benny originally? yeah benny Sa yeah. It, it, yeah. oh my god that would have been great that would have been really really sick yeah yeah, I, I, and, and I, I, I know that due to due to scheduling conflicts, he wasn't able to. I think Nicholas Braun is better at Jim Henson. Uh, I agree. The two. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but also it yeah. helps that his entire face is covered with the beard. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean that. But again, that, but he has the that, look down. That's, <laughs> he, that, he, that's the that's the uh, costume designer giving a performance for him. Essentially, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, but again, like those characters are pretty small i mean they, almost they are cameo ish they are um, they are so i'm, and, a, hu and I'm yet, a huge fan though of both of those guys like jim henson and andy kaufman sure, sure, and sure. you know like we had it obviously man on the moon 25 years ago where jim carrey brilliantly played andy kaufman uh -huh. we've never yeah. had a biopic about jim henson but we just had that documentary come out about him earlier this year and you know hearing the idea of jim henson being presented in a feature film related to the first tape of SNL was really cool. Cause on top of that too, I think it's really cool to know that Jim Henson was somewhat affiliated 
with that first taping of SNL because that's awesome. You know, a lot of yeah. people didn't even think about that. I for, certainly forgot that element of it as well. But despite the small screen time, I do wish that you know there was a bit more justice given. That's just that's me fair. though. Like that's just yeah. me. It's the the, yeah. the one performance that I was a little uncertain about to say the least i'm not going to say it was bad or that i didn't like it it might actually be it's a very brief one it might actually be nicholas podney who plays billy crystal uh, because yes. he is so good at the billy crystal vocalizing like it's Absolutely. like he, he speaks for like five seconds it's like oh he's playing billy crystal you could you could, you, could clo- the, you could close I, your eyes yeah. and you think you're hearing exactly billy crystal. I, it's uncanny I, yeah. Exactly. I think he's too good. That's the problem. I think. good. Are you he, jealous he, that you can't pull that off? I can't pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> it just it just made me value my own life less. That's exactly why. <laughs> but no, like, yeah. it, it's it's because I think it's the one performance that's so good at capturing the ethos of who he's playing that it starts to slowly go against the mythological elements that I think this movie is doing really well. I think that's the one where it's like, okay, now we're getting a little bit too literal with trying to capture reality here. Uh, so okay. it, it's, it's the one that I thought was just maybe too on point, if that makes sense. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I agree, but I do wholly understand why you would come to that conclusion because you absolutely know who he's playing without even needing yeah. to be told. Yeah. But I do think, the way that character is interwoven still kind of taps into the frenetic chaos. Oh, yeah. I don't mind the writing of him playing. here. I think that's fine. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think that the performance is over the top or trying to be a, a straight up imitation um, as much as he's certainly getting into the, the vocal dialect um, w- without overdoing. I don't think any of mm-hmm. these performances are overdoing it. Um, you know, mm, I think it's a no, great combination I, of the actors capturing the essence of the person, the makeup and costuming, doing some of the lifting there as well, and the cinematography helping with that as well in terms of the framing and composition. I think all mm. of those aspects play into capturing these characters in the right way that, again, elevates the mythological aspect without ever getting literal I, I just i never found the film veering over that line even if crystal might come the closest i still don't think it ever crosses it at least it okay. never did for me okay that's fair yeah it got to a point where i wouldn't say he overdoes it in fact i kind of wish he would have overdone it a little bit more to add maybe a bit more of a cartoonish quality to it but i think his performance is so on point that my first thought was some production company is going to tap him to do a Billy Crystal biopic and they're going to submit it for Oscars. Like it was that good of a performance. I feel like it's like that, okay, this... I could see happening. I, yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting close to that territory for I sure. I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, anything, anything else? Uh, or I guess we should probably talk about do we want to talk about J.K. Simmons? Do we want to talk about? The Carson aspect of this as well. Do you guys the Carson element that? of it was interesting. It was something that I didn't mm-hmm. anticipate being present here, but I didn't even think about the fact that obviously Carson, the Tonight Show, he was hosting it at the time that SNL started. And yeah, even though it was a pretty brief moment, I I dug it. And J.K. Simmons, I mean, going off that, JD, um, I mean, when when do you watch a movie with J.K. Simmons and say he's bad in the movie? Like he's al- he's <laughs> no. always knocking out of the park. I mean, basically him telling Chevy Chase to f- off was awesome. That was great. Yeah, um, I love that. Yeah. And um, well, quite literally, with a with a, we'll we'll just say a certain prop. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Prop of the year. It's the prop yeah. of the year, man. Um, yeah. I, I, J.K. Simmons knows how to commit to a bit. I'll give him that. Um, he's he's really good there. Um. You know, we haven't really talked much about Gabriel LaBelle and how, how good his performance is to really kind of carry this thing. Uh, uh, b- before we do, can we yeah. conclude the section on Simmons and sure. Carson? Because I, I sure. do want to talk about that a little bit further. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, because I, I am with you, Brian. I wasn't too aware of the historical context of what kind of led to SNL and the events of this film. And I do wish selfishly that the film did a little bit more with that. But I I think if it did, it simultaneously would have perhaps undermined 
this mythological approach that we keep talking about. So it's a little bit of a polarity in that regard. But I do think it is a fascinating moment when we see the phone call that Carson has with Lorne mm-hmm. and what that means in terms of Lorne and how he is being puppeteered by the mm-hmm. executives, by Carson and some of the behind the scenes of late night and how in some ways that I guess in a weird way, I think this is more accidental and me maybe overanalyzing, but you think about the, uh, the history of late night television in general. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is 30, what, 30, 40 years before we would get to the whole Conan stuff, but like late night for yeah. a long time until about the last dozen years or so, it was a little bit cutthroat or a lot of bit cutthroat. Sure. sure. And to see how this kind of taps into that, again, maybe adding to that mythology a little bit, um, especially when you think of like Carson and how revered he is as a figure in this space and at this Mm -hmm. time, or Milton Burley and his reputation as well, like how this film deconstructs those two in a way to essentially be the antagonist to Lorne and this specific story. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because Lorne is wanting to, you know, reconform what comedy can be on television, which is what I like so much about the writers in this film and how they're trying to, again, <laughs> incessantly undermine the censor censorship lady and that whole dynamic yeah. throughout the film. And, uh, and, and a lot of the ideas that they provoke here and how, uh, you know, how we see some of the sketches unfold and yeah. how it, it's so counterintuitive to what the American audience would have been accustomed to that you do see the seeds of how revolutionary SNL would would come to be. Um, so, like, again, I kind of wish that the film did a little bit more with those things here, um, but I, I still found it interesting enough that specific dynamic with Carson and then Simmons. And he's just incredible here in his little yeah. performance. And it makes for some very memorable scenes as you guys are talking about, especially that moment with chase and how that unfolds. But uh, yeah, I just, I thought that was a, a fascinating it, dynamic. It showcases the, um, not just the competitive nature of late night television of that time, but the lack of unity, the lack of respect they had for each other. Um, and, the the emphasis on structure i guess is the way um i kind of saw it and what made snl work and what made it succeed was by doing the exact opposite of that it was about unity and lack of structure uh it, it ended up more or less becoming something that was written on the fly it wasn't something that conformed to the structure of late night television and that's where that riff with johnny carson came from in many ways because he's sort of part of that that old system that's now being uh, challenged by someone else much younger. So there's another way yeah. we can defend the young casting mm-hmm. <laughs> because you have someone much younger coming in to really just throw a wrench in all of this and try something new. Uh, and that's yeah. essentially the success of SNL at the end there. So I think yeah. that's where the, 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 the emphasis on the Johnny Carson rivalry, if you will, does have a place, even if it is yeah. you know, a little bit manufactured, a bit obvious, I think dramatically speaking, it's, not the most complex thing in the world by any no, means. No, it's not. Uh, but I think it. I think it at least serves a purpose in this movie and is utilized well enough to make a to make a to make a point out of it. Yeah, especially the Simmons performance. That character, it does play into not just the chaos and the energy of the moment, but mm-hmm. his scenes do play out well comedically as well. So tonally, it it does fit in well. Um, I think yeah. maybe where. Again, it's a little bit of a polarity because I think if the, if they were going to make a dramatic version of these events, that would have to be the nucleus of the story, right? Like those two characters, oh, sure. yeah. how Michael Lorne and SNL was trying to deconstruct those two specifically. Mm-hmm. I think there's a dramatic version of this where where that is the heartbeat of the film and it is quite riveting. Um, mm-hmm. that I, I like, I see that and I am fascinated by it, which is why I think I, I wish the film did a little bit more 
of it. But at the same time, I'm glad the film doesn't get too bogged down in it because it didn't yeah. need to. It, yeah. it didn't need Agreed. to. So like, I, it, maybe it stumbles slightly, but I don't think it stumbles too much. I think it mostly weaves all of that here well enough for me. Um, uh, Gabriel so yeah. LaBelle. Anyway. Gabriel LaBelle. Yeah, we can talk about him mm-hmm. more. He's a yes. star. He's a star. He really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, he's because I, how many films has he been in now? I guess three. I mean, I, I only, I can only think of three I that I've feel seen. Like I've only seen the three. Yeah. 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 That's the Fableman snack shack. And now this, and mm. I don't know, there's something about him that you just can't take your eyes off this guy. Uh, he just, he knows how to carry a movie. He really does. Uh, and that's a, I mean, so many, so many people who are marketed to become movie stars, just know how to shine in the moment. And that's not to undersell their abilities. There have been many great actors who are so good at doing that, but it takes a very particular kind of skill to be your movie's nucleus in many ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, like that, that's, that, that's, a, that's kind of a huge burden <laughs> to, to carry. And like, like Gabriel LaBelle does this so effortlessly. Uh, it's mm-hmm. almost like, it's almost like he's done this for many years. And yeah, but yeah, yeah, we talked about this. He's what, 21 <laughs> years wild. old or something like mm-hmm. that. Uh, that's yeah. pretty wild. Uh, it makes me rethink some of my life choices that mm-hmm. I, at 21, <laughs> I was still in college. That was definitely <laughs> not that skilled at 21 years old. No, no, no I was not either. Who, uh, who's going to be the next real life person he plays? That's a good question. That's a great point. Cause he, but two out of those three, uh, I mean, w- one and a I half. I guess all three of them. All three of them are based off real life people. I think. Actually, right? even in Snack Shack, that's you know based off of I forget the director's name, but based off Adam of uh, Ray. Yes. Adam, uh, yeah, yeah, Ray, Ray Meyer. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so I guess that that's his that's niche a trend. Then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it ain't broke, don't a... fix it. <laughs> exactly. We just keep doing what you're doing, and it's yeah. interesting because I I do think all three performances are are pretty different from each other. Uh, yeah. So I, I think he's shown some great range with those three performances as well. Agreed. Um, and and I do like how here he threads that needle wonderfully between the anxiety that he is feeling and how that obviously escalates as things get more chaotic. Uh, but at times he's also quite funny here, and um, and mm-hmm. and even there's the one moment where he has to be purposefully not funny when reading jokes and dialogue when he's there at the uh the the weekend desk yeah. and he's trying to do the gag and can't do it i mean that's I, like i think he just handles that moment really well in terms of not landing the comedy and invoking that insecurity in him simultaneously um it, it's real tricky but man he he threads it perfectly and uh, um yeah I man, think he carries I- the film so well I forgot that Gabriel LaBelle had a part in Shane in the Black's Predator. The Predator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, Poor guy. I mean, Poor guy. I think, I, I think we can, we can at least forget about that. teenager then, though. Yeah. Yeah. That was 2018. Yeah. So that was uh, four years before the Fablemans, at least based on release dates. Yeah. And who knows when they actually shot that film. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look. But um, Yeah. I mean, I like to yeah. think the Predator doesn't even exist anymore. No, I don't mm-hmm. really recall much about that film. I, th- so. I think that's honestly one of the worst films we've ever done during the Inception film era. <laughs> yeah, not a fan at all. Yeah. Um. At any rate, uh, yeah, he's really great. Do do love him. Uh, anything else? Any final thoughts you guys have here on Saturday night? I want to highlight the um, cinematography and the decision to shoot this on 16 millimeter. When I saw that tip, Jason Reitman had talked about how it was a tough battle against Sony to let him shoot this on 16 millimeter. And honestly, I, I'd be curious to watch this film had it been shot digitally and the thing with it being shot on 16 millimeter, it looks like you're watching a film from the 70s. It looks like you're in that time period. Sometimes when you watch these period pieces and they're shot digitally, it takes you out of it. Sometimes the look of it is nailed perfectly. But then there are other times when you watch these films and they're supposed to be set in this time. And you're like, oh, I feel like I'm watching a film from 2024, not a film from 19, whatever year it's set in. Mm-hmm. I felt like mm-hmm. I was watching a film from the seventies. Like I felt like I was watching 
like you said, Brendan, Robert Altman films or even PTA films. A lot of yeah. his films tend to tend to be yeah. set in the seventies, and they're shot yeah, on film he loves stock Altman and everything. As well, so. He yeah, loves Altman. Yeah, so <laughs> and, there's, and a, there's, there, there, there's an influence within an influence within an influence happening. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> too many influences one after the other, but. I think yeah. the imagery here is something that a lot of people aren't talking about. And I do wish that people would highlight that a lot more when they talk about it. Cause with this massive ensemble piece, a lot of people are talking about the cast and the script and the directing, yeah. but nobody seems to be highlighting the cinematography. And I wish it was. And there are so many moments where the grain really, really pops, especially the sequences where the sure. lighting may be a bit dark, but then you, we brought up that ice rink scene outside at Rockefeller center. The grain really popped there in particular, because there wasn't a lot of light. It was going off mm -hmm. the light of the rink and everything, but I thought that was amazing. And I'm a guy who loves the idea of more studio films being shot on celluloid. Listen, digital film puts out amazing work. There's a lot of beautiful images that have been captured on digital cameras and what have you, but there's just something very magical about film stock. And we talked about how this is a bit of a time capsule of the 70s, yeah. and shooting it on film felt like we were brought back to that time period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good point too. Uh, it, 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 the commitment to the 1970s aesthetic is kind of a charming thing to see, especially when movies nowadays are just so heavily digitized, whether they're shot on film or not. We sometimes see movies that are shot on film nowadays, yet they're so cleanly rendered that it almost mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. look, looking at you, Twisters. <laughs> um, but, but I do agree with you there as far as the utilization of film here. It does feel like it was shot on film, which is a charming thing to see. I do want to call out, as far as a few performances here that we didn't get a chance to highlight, I want to call out, uh, uh, blanking on his name all of a sudden, um, oh, oh to uh, Tommy Dewey as Michael O'Donoghue. Mm -hmm. I thought he was really great as well. And I also want to highlight Lamorne Morris, who plays Garrett Morris, yeah. primarily because My guy. You know, he he's, has he's what really I think fun. might be the biggest laugh in the movie for me. And that's and his, is it the song? It's the, the song. song. It's the song. Yeah. Well, the reason, uh -huh. I mean, it's it's a it's bit so of a good. it's a bit of an inside thing because. Just a few days ago, <laughs> uh, my wife and I were hanging out with her dad, my father-in-law, and he just randomly started talking about SNL doing this one joke, this one musical scene early on, and he started singing it, and it's that song. So when it actually happened, and my wife and I were in the theater seeing this movie, we just looked at each other like, we have to take your dad to see this now, because <laughs> he literally That's referenced so it but like by accident only a few days ago. Um, so a bit of an inside reason as to why it worked for me, but even outside of that context, I like the, uh, the kind of the nostalgia beating of how iconic that that yeah. song was for us and all in that first season. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was really nice, nicely placed for a mm -hmm. piece of nostalgia. Yeah. I thought that was a great moment. That might've been the biggest laugh for me as well. And I certainly don't have that context uh, yeah. <laughs> as you do, <laughs> but I thought it was great. I love Lamar Morris here. Uh, I thought he was really great. And again, as we've been talking about, these characters are not, you know, it's not a character drama. It's not a character piece. There's not a ton of nuance to them, but I do mm -hmm. like how he kind of taps into some of his reservations and why he's even here and the stereotypes yeah. that he's forced to play in how that kind of plays a part in, in kind of leading up to everything. So, yeah, I thought that was a great gag, and, um, yeah, I love that as well. Um, the only performance here that took me out of the film, and this is not a fault of the actor or the performer, it's just that John Batiste has such a distinct personality that the man... It mm -hmm. can only be John Batiste to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I don't care what kind of makeup and hair that you put on him. Yeah, all yeah. I see is John Batiste. I, I so. never, I never got the sense I was seeing Billy Preston. <laughs> no, no, absolutely no. not. Yeah, and I, again, I love John. Love him. He's really fun. Uh, great musician, obviously, but I just—he just is never going to be able to sink into a character because mm -hmm. he's just so—he's got such a bombastic personality, which I love. Yeah. But that was the only moment that kind of took me out is when he was there on screen. And, you know, and I don't, I don't know 
you know, because Brian, you noted earlier, this has been getting some mixed reception or, or tepid receptions. Um, I saw this on Saturday night, uh, this last weekend, watching Saturday night on Saturday night during SNL. So during Saturday night, as it was live on television. Completely so sandwiching I don't know yourself if, in Saturday nights. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it was the whole meta concoction of it all and it created this magical spell that just wafted over me. I don't know. But there were there was something about where about how I just I had a lot of fun with this film and its and its approach. I think fundamentally it had the right approach and I mm-hmm. think it executes on it extremely well. Uh, it's a great crowd pleaser of a film. It's one that I would recommend, which is perhaps why, again, I know we talked about this a little bit on the main show this last week, Brendan, but I'm still struck yeah. by how this isn't performing at the box office or even the release structure of it. I don't know if you know more about this, Brian, than we do, but um, it's just a, a little weird to me that it doesn't seem to be expanding beyond our little film sphere, like our little scope, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it's, it just, it feels like a film that 25 years ago would have made a hundred million dollars at the box office and it would have won four Oscars. Um, and I, I don't know, it just doesn't seem to be trending that way in 2024, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's, a little yeah, it's, it's definitely a little interesting to say the least. Cause even though SNL has definitely declined in quality these last few years, it's still yeah. popular. Like people still watch SNL and yeah. everything. Like there are episodes of SNL that air now that are legitimately great, like really yeah. great episodes. It obviously factors on whoever is the guest host and everything. But yeah, I am definitely surprised that this movie hasn't been performing as well at the box office as it should. But I mean – we're in the state where there are so many movies out right now. Like there's so much out there right now that it's unfortunately Mm -hmm. being buried underneath the slew of all the things that are out right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some Oscar players out right now. There's some blockbusters out right now. And now we're getting to the point where a bunch of horror movies are coming out because we're getting closer to Halloween. So unfortunately I feel like this is going to be a movie that is not going to do well in the theater I do believe, though, that once it comes to streaming, a lot of people will sit down and check it out. I feel like it's going to perform great very point. well yeah. at home yeah. on I streaming. Can see it playing well there. Yeah. People gathering their friends and their family and their loved ones and what have you and just sitting on the couch and watching this movie because it is a really great movie to watch with friends popping on. But also, I think it's a good movie to watch with your parents and everything because – my parents don't really go to the movies that much anymore, and I've told them that this is a movie that they're going to like because they love original Saturday Night Live and everything. But I guarantee mm-hmm. with every five million be in, once this does come out the stream, they're absolutely going to pop it on as soon as it comes to yeah. Netflix or whatever streaming service it comes to because it's going to sure. perform very well because – you know, like I said, there are so many movies out right now. And even though there's not this massive box office juggernaut that's out right now, It is sad to see that this movie isn't performing as strongly as it should, especially because, like, you know, now it's playing everywhere and now everyone could go see it. Plus, there's at least one actor that everybody loves. And again, it's Saturday Night Live. You would think that people would love to go see a movie regarding the early days of SNL. But I'm sure Sure. there are some people that are thinking that that aren't on top of movies like we are. They yeah. think that this is a full-on biopic when, yeah, it's just a certain time frame of SNL and everything. Yeah. 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 No, it, it's an interesting point. And, um, yeah, I just I, – I, I don't think that Sony's done the greatest job marketing this either. I think that's part of it. They mm. haven't really poured in the amount of resources I think it deserves. And maybe, to mm-hmm. your point, Brian, they are waiting for that premium D, you know, uh, on demand release and, or wherever it may go streaming, that's where they might pour in some of those marketing resources. Yeah. And while it did go wide, the only number I've been able to see is that it went to 2,300 theaters, which is not a lot. That is that's, not that, a that, super that, wide release. That, that's the lowest of wides you can imagine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's half of what a Deadpool will get for our context. So yeah. um, it's not playing 
everywhere like I would hope that it that that it would. The release structure was also kind of weird. Again, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. apologies to those that listened to the main show this week already, but Brendan in Philadelphia got it a week before I did. And I live in the Miami yeah. area, so I'm not like in a small market per se, but we did not get it the same week that you guys did. So it it's weird how it had, you know, it played at the festivals. It had a limited release, and, you know, and then kind of went wide, sort of. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It almost feels like Sony was really just waiting for, you know, the on-demand release which will probably take place in about two weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It's just been weird. And because you know, I do feel like this could have been more of an awards player or at, at, at the very least been, been able to recoup its, its budget back. Cause it, it's not a film that costs a ton. I think it, well, the budget here is like 30 million, 25, 30. I feel like this film should have been able to at least do that at the box office. But like yeah. you said, JD, if this came out like 10 plus years ago, this would have made a hundred million dollars. It would hands have. Down. Hands down. Would have. Yeah. Yeah. It's strange. The, yeah. the change. It's a pleaser. Of, it's a pleaser. Yeah I, yeah. I could see that. I could see a world where that did happen. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but we recommend it. We do like it. It's a good Hopefully, movie. It's you good know, movie. for those listening, it's you very go good movie. check it out. Um, if you agree or disagree with anything we had to say here, if you're watching on YouTube, please leave a comment below. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, reach out to us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd. You can always email us in sessionfilm at gmail.com as well. Brian, thanks so much for being here. This was a pleasure, yeah. man. Thank you for having me. It was such a blast being here, and it was great to finally come on here. I know, JD, yes. like you said at the top, you've been trying to get me on forever, but you finally yeah. caught me. You finally gotcha. caught me. I was like, oh, gotcha. all right, God damn it. I'll, I'll come on. <laughs> yeah. Just leave now me alone. You, now you can't leave. I know. I know. Reaching out to him incessantly, like, come on, Brian, let's do this. Let's do this. And finally got him. Uh, so, yeah. Really do appreciate you being here. Uh, tell us about all the great work that you do online. Where can we follow you on social media? Yeah, you guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterbox at Brian Suffield. I contribute with the Rolling Tape. We do written mm-hmm. reviews, podcasts, publications, interviews, yeah. the whole shebang. And then you could subscribe to my podcast, Life Moves Pretty Fast, on all podcast platforms. We drop episodes every Wednesday. And if you love coming-of-age cinema – it's the podcast for you. We talk about a coming of age film every single week. Oh, uh, my time jam. of recording, the yeah. next episode will be on Spirited Away. So oh. be on the lookout for that. Okay. There's a lot okay. of great episodes coming your way. So, um, yeah, thank you again for having me, gentlemen. It was a great time yeah. being here. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Really do appreciate you being here. Definitely go and check out Brian's work. It's fantastic. We are huge coming of age fans. One of our favorite types. We're, of well, yeah, just we're, like I get you on the pod now. We're, we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're not. We're, we're not. We're, not, we're, we're not just fans of coming of age films. We're fans of coming of age. It's basically what you <laughs> oh, <say. exactly. laughs> well, You're the perfect yeah, candidates. You're the perfect candidates. Yeah, you know, I would absolutely love to come on that show. I mean, I feel we, like I come of age at least like a few times each week or something. Don't we all come of age every single day of our lives? You'll every learn day, something exactly. new every day. Yeah, absolutely. But it is our favorite type of movies generally. So Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Please go and check out Brian's work. Uh, Please give him a follow on social media as well. Certainly a pleasure to have you here. Um, With all of that said, as I noted a couple of times, please go check out the main show this week, episode 606. It's available. Now we talk about our favorite horror films of all time. We talk about the discourse surrounding that variety article that came out last week. Uh, we talk about the the continued fallout of the Joker box office disappointment, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. So that is available. Uh, we will also have a review of the documentary animated film Piece by Piece. That's coming out this week as well. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, before we get out of here, gentlemen, do you have any final thoughts on anything before we leave this episode? Oh, I mean, honestly, now I'm just thinking about coming of age films. Just get <laughs> Brian, <laughs> podcast. Hell yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah the, exactly. the day, the day y'all, unless you've already done it, I missed it. The day y'all decide to do Petite Maman, the Celine uh, Chiama oh, film. Oh, the episode's coming. It's okay, coming. okay. I, I might have to force my way onto that one. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He is the biggest no, champion no of that film. Not, There's not. no doubt about that. <laughs> I, I think that's the best movie of the century so far. Yeah. No, I don't know uh, if it's that good, but <laughs> I'm trying to make a hyperbolic. It's a, it's, a, it's a good movie. I really like it as well. I love yeah. that you love it that much. That's my favorite thing. One of my new it. favorite movies. If you're happy, yeah. I'm happy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. With all of that said, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on the Incestual Film Podcast.